Hello, this is Dr. Jack Myers. Welcome to Jack Myers Ministries and Life Family Church Podcast Channel. Be blessed by this message. Go in your weapons manual. We're going to talk this morning about greatly delighted. It's all caps, so we've got to say it right. Psalm 112. Greatly delighted. You know, how we do, how we do what we're doing matters according to the word of God. Um, the, we, the, we know the Bible references the willing and obedient eat the good of the land. So if you're obedient and unwilling, you don't eat the good. If you're willing but never get to the obedience part, you don't eat the good, right? So in other words, how we do the do's matters. Amen? And so we want to talk about this morning about being greatly delighted because the, these are things in the word of God. Again, I love the fact that, that the word is a qualifier. And we'll read scriptures and we can say, I'm that man. I can do that again because it doesn't matter my socioeconomic status, my educational status, uh, what my bank account says, my physical age. None of those things matter when I approach the word. That's why I call the word is a great equalizer. It'll do whatever a man or woman places a demand on it to do in their life, as much or as little as you want. Amen? Amen. And I love that because I don't like excuses. I'm not an excusiologist, and I'm sure you all aren't either, right? So we don't make excuses. So it says this, praise ye the Lord. Notice this command. What does it say? You praise the Lord. Not the worship team, not the pastor, not Hillsong's YouTube. You praise the Lord. So the very first thing this verse leads off with is a command to us as an individual that just says, praise the Lord. And many times we might think, well, I do that. But I would challenge you this week, because I know you're going to take notes and you'll make this part of your daily devotion. Think about how often you actually do that out loud throughout the day. Is it a passing occasional thought, like when you move to the coffee pot in the morning and you just have warm fuzzies, you know, you're thankful for that? Or is it something you're actually doing out loud the majority of your day? And so it's good that we quantify those things. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord. So right here, we have instruction number two. We're told to praise the Lord, and we found out, Pastor taught all weekend on the blessing. You discovered that you are the blessing and that you're already blessed, so you don't need to run around looking for it. It's not outside. It's in here. And what you have to do is just say, Father, teach me how to receive all that's mine better. It's on the receiving end, not the getting end. So blessed is the man that fears or reveres, regards, and honors with respect and awe. So what we can say is, I'm going to be that man to honor the Lord. Now, many times we may think, well, we honor the Lord, but honor is not a thought and it's not an emotion. It's an action. It actually means in this manner, by my hand, a return of suitable benefit. So it's visible and therefore we can measure our honor level. Others can measure our honor level, whether we honor God or honor people, because it's a suitable return not an unsuitable one. It's measurable. To revere him with respect and awe. So when we see that word fear, it's always talking about reverence, which means honoring the Lord. So blessed is that man. So in other words, here's the qualifier. How easy is it to be blessed? Honor the Lord. Praise the Lord. Honor the Lord, right? That delighteth greatly, Notice it didn't say delighteth. We have scriptures that say, delight thyself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. And we we think that means, well, I'll just just get my groove on and praise and worship and delight myself in the Lord. No, that's not what that word delighteth means. That word delighteth means if you will bend yourself and be moldable and pliable, that man will receive what he asks of the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires for it. The moldable, bendable, not the stiff-necked person that's just getting their groove on. I know it sounds like an oxymoron to be stiff-necked, but there are people that will just kind of go, I, I love praise and worship. It's my thing. It's what I do. And they can be very stiff-necked on the inside about that action rather than bringing it honorably 
and reverentially, especially those that draw attention to themselves. That delighteth greatly. So praise ye the Lord is a command. Uh, say this with me. I'm going to praise out loud. When you praise out loud, it violates your flesh. And how many of you need your flesh violated on about a minute-to-minute basis? Because your flesh is always in pursuit of violating you. Your flesh has the biggest mouth of anybody you know. (laughs) I know mine does. It gives the devil something to hear. Your silent prayers, silent meditations of manifesting gratitude. That's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard yet come to light, and I'm sure more coming down the pike. What are they manifesting gratitude? It's just another opportunity for a selfie. Because manifesting gratitude to the King of kings and Lord of lords, that's visible, that's tangible, and we can all see and feel that. Amen? There's unity in praise. That's how the body gets in unity. So the praise is not the time that we, we come late to check our kids in because it doesn't matter if because we're not really a song type of person. I don't really sing on key. I don't, really, I don't really have to be part of worship. So I can just arrive during the worship service to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords because whatever I was doing was more important. Say amen. amen. It's true anyhow. This is how we move together as a unit When we're not even as a unit in worship, it's very difficult for us to move as a unit. Now, I'm not talking about that if you're responding, you're blessed regardless if the other 100 people in the room aren't. But I'm not sure I'm getting across to you the level of power that will function in your life if you join in. Because the corporate anointing exceeds by math, multiplication alone, it's like compound interest exceeds any individual faith, any individual anointing. So when we're maybe not feeling it, it doesn't matter. I come in here and I bring my worship to the king because he is worthy. Who cares what just happened or what didn't happen or what was said or wasn't or how I feel. And also, how about this thought? It's not just for you. It's for your neighbor. If we keep coming into church and when pastor says, anybody come up that wants a blessing and 20 people don't come up, that's unfathomable to me. Now, I know he's not here. He will see this uh, on, on live stream, but, but we eat steak for two when he's not here because when he comes back, we're going to make sure that we're right behind him, not 50 miles behind him. So we get to discuss things when he's not here and, and we're family, right? And you're mature and I know you and you know me. <laughs> and so you know it's Chateaubriand for two this morning and always. So we receive the commands, we obey instructions, we hear, we, we learn to apply them together as a unit. So let's do something. I want you to raise your right hand like this, bend it at the elbow. Now would you raise your left hand in like manner? Now would you go ahead and put your hands all the way up? Everybody, if you would, please. Now put your arms down. Would you stand? Would you raise your right hand? Would you raise your left hand? Would you raise them all the way up? Would you close your eyes? Everybody close your eyes. Don't look at me. And let's sing. Just repeat after me. I don't care. If you think you don't sing, if you don't sing on key, this is all irrelevant. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved someone like me. Sing it like you mean it. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Keep standing, and I want you to picture Jesus on the window screen of your mind and sing this verse. Praise God, praise God. 
Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Stop. Sit down. What if every worship service we came in, no matter what just happened or didn't happen, on time, early, late, we didn't think about ourselves for one second. Lift up my holy hands because he gave me breath. And with my brothers and sisters, I will get in unity whether I feel like it or not because I am not self-absorbed, I am not self-centered, and the king has done too much for me. And I will raise them high just like I do at the ball game. And I will close my eyes and I will get out of my personality of I don't sing and I don't dance because I will do anything for my king. What will it be like tonight if we actually come out of the gate like that and not wait till pastor gets up here and cranks our tractor? (laughs) Crank the tractor. (laughs) Why don't we bring the crank tractor to to it? Do Do you see how easy that was? Do you see how we're all qualified? It didn't matter how tall you were, how wide you were, how old, how young, how smart, how good looking, how rich, we could all. What am I looking at? Jesus. I'm looking at Jesus. Now you know that you're all qualified for this. You just qualified yourself to be the man of verse one because the blessings of verse two through 10 only come to the man of verse one. So now we don't have to go leave church and go, Pastor Marie made us feel like there's one more thing we're not doing. One more thing I gotta change. No, we just, you just qualified yourself. This disqualifies you. This qualifies me to be, how God made it so easy for us to receive the blessing that he deposited on the inside of us, but not just for us to receive it. It wasn't for you just to receive. It was for you to share. And the more you were able to dip down in and pull it up, you would share it and the more it would be multiplied and you would never have to uh, look for your blessing. Now, when pastor calls a line of blessing, what, that's a little different than the blessing is on the inside of you. As in the pastor's office of the shepherd, he can at any time exercise the fullness of that office to bless the sheep. Amen. The shepherd can bless the sheep, whether he has an unction from the Holy One or not. He's unctioned already with the office. So he can bless us. To sit there and say, well, I'm good, means you're not good. Because you thought you were good. That means that's all you're thinking about is you. So when he offers a blessing on us, an impartation by the laying on of his hands, we ought to run up here because we're like, somebody needs it this week. I'm full. Maybe I got everything I need and want, but everybody around me doesn't. Good. I can come and receive. The Father's offering a blessing. Why would we spend one more day sitting in our seat going, I'm good? I don't really feel led. You don't need to feel led. You were asked and invited. That, 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 that's, we don't, needing, no needing for leading on that. In other words, that was the leading right there. Does that make sense? Okay. What are we talking about? Greatly delighted. I'm greatly, greatly. The word greatly means holy, speedily, and vehemently. I have met people that are very, regardless of their personality, vehement about their belief systems. I will not do that. I will do that. They're vehement. Don't tell me that anybody in this room doesn't know what vehement means because you got vehement feelings and words about a great many things. And God forbid someone go cross grain to you. So we, when it says greatly, that means with speed. No more dwaddling, taking our time, and get out of the processing office. We're going to be holy speedily. What do we do? Throw our stuff on the chair and raise our hands, like Simon says. That's all. Not, let me shake it off. Let me just, 
I'm just trying to, I'm trying to feel, get warmed up here. When, when, when the worship team, you know, hits my song, my mo, my mo, Joe, you were, bring mo and Joe with ya. Yeah, there isn't a single service that you have ever witnessed, pastor and I not go safe right up there. Amen. And there's nothing going on in your life that was not multiplied a hundred going ours on ours in the back room and, and naturally always on Sunday. Even more so on Monday because no one cares about our day off. <laughs> this is how we move as a unit. So holy speedily. This means in a strong emotional manner. Say this, I am not led by my emotions. I lead my emotions. We decide what we feel. I don't yield to my emotions. They're given to me by God. They are never to lead. So it, it, my feelings are not relevant to me. You will be so much less mentally and physically fatigued if you'll begin to dismiss that stuff. Save it again for what you like on your pizza or, or something other than that where, where it really matters in life and it is important. But when it comes to the word of God, the house of God, uh, your job and all those things, remove the thinking and feeling the stuff and just skip over it and go right to the action part, right to the greatly delighted part. That's why people can't make it to the greatly delighted because oh, I'm tired just thinking about it. That's your problem. You decided to think about a command. Anybody been in the military? I know Miss Linda, Miss Michelle, anybody? Uh, did, did, did your sergeant issue command and go, now everybody take a little time, take your time. We'll wait while you process, while, while you think on that. Uh, anybody got any questions? I mean, we, we think, well, that's crazy. Well, what you're doing is crazier. The king issued a command, which is different than the drill sergeant. And we're not going, sir, yes, sir, I am yours to your command, yours to command. No, we're going, huh, I'm interested in what I think and feel, but it didn't occur to you to be interested in what God thinks and feels about it. I'm not being hard on you. I'm telling you what's tripping you up and making you face plant day in and day out. Your face is all smashed up. Are you tired of it yet? Okay, greatly, most strong emotional manner. In other words, be as vehement about the Father's commands as you are about your personal opinions and belief systems and your politics and everything else that we post on Facebook. It says diligently with all your might in his commandments. His commandments consist of three things, laws, precepts, and ordinances. The Bible uses those three words. Laws are simply rules that govern our beliefs and practices. You're not ever entitled to say, well, my belief, the word says, and I believe it. I don't have a belief system. God has a belief system, and I agree with that, but I don't have a personal belief system. When people say, well, that's your truth, like, no, it's not. I don't, I don't have a truth. God, there's one way, one truth, it's a person. I don't have a belief system. He Besides my beliefs, I agree. The precepts are the general rules of action that govern my conduct and thought. So the word already told me how to think. I don't have to stop and ponder about what I think. I'm gonna stop and ponder about what God thinks about it. And if you don't know, then open the pages. I'm interested in God's, he has very strong feelings about a great many things and he lists them. He has a lot of thoughts and he lists them. I am not interested in my thoughts and feelings. I already know them. If you know me at all, you know I'm not interested in opinion. I'm not in mine. Why would I be in yours? But what we do is we get paid for opinions. You can cure yourself by not get taking money for your opinion because it's not worth that. And uh, stop offering it. Stop offering it on social media. Don't weigh in on anything. If it, in other words, I'm, I'm giving you tips on how to break yourself of the world's way of doing things, which is, again, causing the face plant. We're talking about greatly die. There's a, people like, well, th didn't the Bible say there was 10 commandments in the old covenant? Actually, there weren't. There were 10 main ones written on stone with the finger of God carved personally. And then in the New Testament, there's a 1,050 commandments. Oh, I thought they were all done away with. Jesus said, I didn't do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. He is the fullness of that law. 
And he said, it's in these two things. On these two things hang all the law and the prophets. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and that's not emotional nature, with all thy mind, that means mentally, and with all thy power, that means your financial strength. All, not part. And the second is like it. You will love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, that means they're all 1,050 ensconced and fulfilled in that. Because if I love God, I don't commit adultery. If I love my neighbor, I don't commit fornication. If I love God, I don't steal. If I love my neighbor, I don't steal things from my office, my office uh, employer. In other words, all those commandments were fulfilled in love himself that's on the inside of us. So they were not done away with, they were fulfilled. That means we have the ability to walk in the fullness of Christ-like character should we allow that to be birthed in us and to be formed in us, amen? Amen. And, And one of the ways to do that is move into the greatly delighted, right? Ordinances are established rites or ceremonies, certain things that how God wants things done in his house, etc. Very easy, right? Laws, precepts, and ordinances. Matthew 22, 37, that's the verse. Two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. So verse one, this is the man or woman that honors the Lord and follows his commands and receives the blessing. How easy is that to qualify for the blessing? Be the man of verse one. Is that a decision? Yeah, it's just a decision. You already are that, but you you have to actually choose to not do something out of total rebellion. So if you're like, Lord, he he put the nine fruit of the spirit on the inside of you, joy is on the inside of you, peace is on the inside of you. You have to decide to be unjoyful. You make a choice that you're not gonna be peaceful. You make a decision not to walk in love. These are decisions. They're, they're, we're not being led around by the nose, by the devil, or anybody else. So if those things are in us and we're made in the image of God and his nature is the in, on the inside of us, then we have the ability to lean on that propensity. That means we have to make a willful choice not to do one of those at any given moment and, and flesh out, amen? amen? And not be greatly delighted. And so when we choose not to be greatly delighted, we disqualify ourselves. But we pastor taught all weekend on, on what the blessing is and how you know how to walk in it. And so what we're talking about today is make sure you don't disqualify yourself by the smallest thing. Yeah. Why would we do that? Yeah. But, but notice when you do that, even in your kitchen, even in your bathroom, the other day I was walking into the kitchen and I was listening to a podcast and, and, and just overwhelming gratitude. And, and normally I don't get down on my knees because I might need a little assistance getting back up. But I, I held onto the counter and I had my slippers on. It was a tough force. So I put my slippers and I just knelt and I just wept in gratitude and was thanking God for something, a story that I heard, thanking him for his goodness. I was so grateful. So this is a lifestyle. This is, this is so easy to yield to. And you, when you're yielding to that, you have no problems. You have no problems with people. You have no financial problems. You have no physical problems. And your biggest problems, you anyway. And amazing, here's the one thing that goes away in this posture, you. If that won't cause you to raise a hallelujah, anybody ever get out of bed and you are sick of meeting yourself? Like the first thing I got to see every day is you in the mirror, deal with you attitude and your thoughts and your feelings. Yeah. (laughs) Hallelujah, right? What your attention is on, what you're talking about is what you're actually praising. God's trying to get that across to us. Let me say this. What your attention is on, make sure it can deliver you. If your attention is on your finances, go right ahead, attend away. Make sure they can deliver you. I'll tell you what, they can't. If your attention is on the political arena or social media or what someone said or didn't say to you, they didn't affirm you enough today, make sure that can deliver you what your attention is on. What your attention is on is what you're automatically praising because the Bible says to attend is to give praise. So when I'm attending to my body and that it doesn't feel good and talking about it, when people texted me this week because I was catching up to my healing as fast as I could, how you doing? I'm catching up to my healing, getting better by the minute. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. 
I don't, I don't consult my body to, know, to wonder, oh, I guess I'm not healed. You know, I guess I need... I am the healed. These are lying symptoms, and I refuse to move out of that. And I don't consult my body to tell me how I'm going to talk, think, act, or feel. Amen. And if I'm not going to consult my own body, I'm not consulting anybody else. I don't suffer by the need for public affirmation. You might want to jo- join that, right? That's not a personality thing, and I don't make light of that. Thank you, Father. At the age 39, God dropped on me an endowment and delivered me from that delivered me supernaturally. Thank God it was before I met you all and started to pastor because that'll kill you. Yeah, yeah and so I, I didn't even know I, I had an issue with that. Wasn't something I talked to, to the Lord. I'm not shy, introverted, but not shy. And so uh, I, I didn't even talk to the Lord about it, but I fe- physically felt the tangible him reaching in and just pulling out. It like the thought never crossed my mind again. I thought, I guess this is good, but I'm not so sure with my personality. Because I'm like, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. <laughs> Lord, you have, to, you have to endow me on that other grace and to balance that out. But in other words, if that's your issue, uh, I, uh, in other words, of all the people you're concerned about, they pay in your bills, they die for you on the cross, they're making a home in heaven for you. Yeah, they comfort you, they're with you every day. They wrote you a love letter. Letters from home, love letters from father. They do any of that for you? No, not even my spouse and my best friend who happens to be your pastor. Nobody like him on the planet. But he's not Jesus. And he's not in the place of Jesus. He's not my savior. Amen? What your attention is on and what you're talking about is what you're praising. Make sure it can deliver you. Your problems can't deliver you. How about other people's problems? Stop talking about other people's problems. Even if they've been assigned to you to solve. I've learned to just, I am a problem solver. It's what I have to do all day, every day, globally, seriously. And I can get annoyed with that. But let me just tell you this. What you complain about, you'll forfeit grace over. What you complain about, you will lose grace for. And don't think you want to lose. Well, I don't care if that goes away or not. You will care <laughs> when God has assigned you to bring, bring your faith to something so that he can be uh, working through you. Amen? Amen? So verse two, his seed, underline the word his seed. Whose seed? The man of verse one. Say, I'm the man, I'm the man. of verse one. His seed. Now, this word seed is figurative, not literal. The Bible is mostly literal, except when it's figurative. And when it's figurative, you are to still get, get the literal meaning from the figurative and do it. There you go, Bible doctrines. His seed, which means figuratively his posterity and future generations shall be mighty. So you're leaving a legacy whether you want to or whether you think you are or not. So everybody that you speak words to and impart to, everybody that's coming behind you in your family, uh, in your friends, uh, whether it's children, grandchildren, uh, nieces, nephews, these kids in this church, I'm everybody's mama, but so are you. So they're watching us to know how to navigate this thing called Christianity and church. They listen to how you talk. How you talk in your home about the pastor and this church will matter on whether they're ever here or not in their future. And I always know what people say because their children are so uh, innocent. And how they act around me is I know exactly what is or is not said in the home. And no, that's not a word of knowledge. <laughs> it's that thing found only on the black market called common sense, yeah, and human nature. <laughs> maybe, maybe every now and then on eBay it'll pop up. His seed uh, will collectively be mighty. That word mean mighty is powerful champions. Powerful champions, people that are watching your life. The Bible says, let the older women teach the younger women. Now, it doesn't always mean chronologically older, but it should. Chronological age, (laughs) excuse me, like, let me just point out the Blonskys, should match spiritual maturity. But it's not, just because someone is older doesn't mean you should follow their advice, okay? They're safe. 
marriage, children. Let them teach the younger. It can be younger chronologically, but younger in the Lord. So maybe you're, you're 50, but you don't know how to raise your kids and grandkids. And maybe you think you do, but we all know that you don't. <laughs> Is it okay to ask advice and you don't even know you need it? Is it okay to go, you know what, you... you there's probably things I don't know, but I'm so ignorant, I don't know what I don't know. It's okay to not have the question and say, what is it about me that you see about me that I could change to make me a better me? And then shut up and listen and then do it. <gasps> Shock and awe. Do it. Don't ask if you're not going to do, because don't steal the most valuable thing people have, and that's time. Amen. Ask no advice that you don't intend on doing so they can enjoy the fruit. Don't steal their harvest by making an opinion poll out of somebody that's traded life for wisdom and that you would steal that and dishonor it. You won't reap a harvest from that. Hallelujah. I meant to be nicer. Let me try. <laughs> Some of y'all are looking at me like, holy cow, you're, you're new. It's okay. Uh, you're like, where is the pastor on his way? <laughs> on his way back. Yeah. Okay, verse three. Uh, no, verse two. Mighty, upon the earth, the generation of the upright. I love this word upright. It means straight. So am I standing up straight? That means you're going to have to be straight. Don't be bent. Don't be crooked. No one cares about your bent. Where do, where do they bend to? You better be straight. I love what Keith Moore used to say. He's like, hey, in a Holy Ghost service, um, if we're going to run, run fast. If we're going to shout, shout loud. If we're going to jump, jump high. But when you come down, walk straight. In other words, none of that matters if you're not upright. Upright means straight. There's no bending. I'm not, I don't mean the bending as in the pliable to the Lord. I mean having the bents. God said he'll make the crooked path straight. Let him make the areas in your life that are crooked so that you stand upright. Why? This is the man that's blessed. Again, we find that there is no qualification in finances, education, age, or anything except being upright. And, and we can all equally receive that uprightness because Jesus did everything right, not you. That's good news. So it's his uprightness, not your perf perfection in your flesh that's going to do it. But recognizing when there's something bent and twisted and broken in your mind or your heart or body and say, Look, call it out on yourself. The, I, I'm not putting up with that. That's not okay for me thinking that way anymore. Why don't you bust your own chops? If you're getting mad at everybody doing it, they wouldn't have to do it if you do it. Nobody's got to get on my backside because there's no room. The sign that says occupado, occupied. It's occupied. I'm on it. All day, every day. And if I miss the opportunity, then my boss, my husband, my pastor comes by and, and helps me. Anytime you receive correction, know this, you, you, you forfeited the opportunity for self-correction. And instead of being mad that you, someone cared enough to help you correct something bent, crooked, or twisted and kicking them in the shin and being offended, you ought to fall on your feet and worship the Lord. Thank you, Father, that you put somebody in my life that, that, that's brave enough to risk my anger and help me because nobody cares about you in society. I guarantee it. Yeah. This man shall be blessed. And that word blessed means this. See, what we've been doing is looking for my blessing. But the Bible translates this word blessed to kneel in adoration to God. He calls the man who kneels and adores God the blessed man. Now, maybe you have a hard time kneeling or need assistance. That doesn't matter. Do it at home if you can't do it at church. But the man who kneels, God says, is blessed, not the man that says, I need a blessing. I want a blessing. Gimme, gimme, gimme. My name is Jimmy. Us four, no more. The man who kneels in adoration to God. He recognizes, Father, help me. You're where my help comes from. Thank you for all that you've helped me. And thank you that you've never given up on me and you're gonna keep on helping me. And I know where my help's coming from today, tomorrow, and all my tomorrows. That man, God calls blessed. And when God calls you blessed, you blessed. Amen? Verse three, wealth. See, Harris gets to the good part. 
Say, I'm the man of verse one. Here's the blessing, wealth. That word wealth means cumulative. It's easy to get money and then lose it again. So the Bible calls the blessing when you begin to accumulate. And I don't mean a hoarder. I don't mean being a stuff person and a things person and just amassing things for things sake. I'm talking about cumulative wealth. That means all that you've put in my hand, Father, is yours. I'm yours to command. I'm a builder. Builders need supply for the kingdom. So we're building the kingdom. This building takes a lot more supply than your home, our home, individual homes. Practice your faith on your home. Get, the, get it fixed up, cleaned up, repaired, inside, out, furnished, cleaned, decorated. Practice your faith on that. What we do is we have always brought our supply to the health, house of God. And how I practice is I had to bring my faith to my house. Amen. How do you think we grew our faith? Amen. Pastor Dan Bolt, who uh, you'll see in February, he's a board member. Uh, we were at just in California with him. And I was telling him, because he hadn't been back since the first time we were there with him, and I said, I'm just reminded of you saying we needed to come to this meeting in 09 and how our lives were never the same in a, in a vast way because you just made a suggestion as our board member and we listened and did it and, and, and believed God for the mon money at that time to do that. And on top of that blessing, he, he sat down with me. We were sitting out at a little coffee table at a coffee shop, and uh, Pastor Sandy, his wife, and Dr. Jack were in line. They're the sanguines. Dr. Dan and I have more of a <laughs> introvert nature. We were sitting down having a conversation, and he, he was kind enough to tell me, you have no personal faith. Most people would have been, oh, how dare he speak to me like that? I can't believe that, that he would say something so offensive and so hurtful and who do you think you are? And all these things at the time. And I just looked at him and went, I was intrigued. Thank you. Okay. What meaneth this? And he went on to tell me, he said, I see that you have great crusade faith. You guys have learned to believe God for 30,000 or whatever for crusade in addition to your living. You've used all your faith on that. And he said, but you have no personal faith. It was his observation as our friend. And he said, uh, that's going to be a problem for you. you in other words, you, you need to develop something. I appreciated knowing what I didn't know. Here was a man that's being our friend. He's on the board, looking into our future and saying, you're leaving off something. You're, you're doing everything over here, and you need to balance that out. And it wasn't something that, that was going to poof, wave a wand, and happen overnight. So I said, thank you, sir, for helping my form. And I went home and I took that to the Lord. I didn't go, well, well can you tell me more? No, take it to the Lord. And so the Lord, uh, I sat on the couch and I learned how to measure faith by that time, thank God. I measured my faith and I ended up finding out that I had $200 of personal faith. There was at that time a timepiece that, that I would have liked to have had and it was like $800. And so I'd never had a watch, an, a nice watch. And this is many, many years ago. We lived in, in Illinois. And uh, so I said, okay, how, Lord, can I believe for that amount? I'm like, no, honest, you had to measure. I, I can believe for about $200. I can believe that in and I'll just have to save it up. And I thought, this is ridiculous. People will go and get something from the, the jewelry counter at the mall any day of the week that don't even have any money for $200. I was like, yeah, he wasn't kidding. <laughs> pathetic. And so I took that to the Lord. And what, was I in a place that I needed to believe for something? No, it was all about the ministry. And I was happy with that. Was I in a, in a place great? If you wait till you need, it'll be too late. Amen. You need to forecast your need and get your faith on it ahead of time. If you're living in a place where you're living in need and you're trying to bring all your faith to it, you're backwards. So you need to be in front of stuff where you have enough faith to meet your need and you're meeting others' needs and the kingdom's needs. And now you're forecasting. Lord, show me what I need to be put in. He'll initiate it to you. I'm not, I'm not talking about, oh, I'm gonna believe for a jet. You can believe for a tire. It's $35,000, the tire. Try a tire. Put the tire on your refrigerator. Okay, yeah. I'm not talking about... Uh, foolishness and presumption. I'm talking about if the Holy Ghost initiating things in your future that you don't know where they are. And that's why we pray much in the spirit. 
because the spirit informs our mind of things our mind doesn't know. The spirit knows what's in the mind of the father and prays those things out for us so we run into them. So he'll initiate, you need to start. So he was initiating to me through a dear friend that you need to start push, pressing your faith. I had to come up with something I want. because nothing wrong with stuff. I'm just not a stuff person. And so I'd be like, okay, you know, I want a really nice timepiece. Today I own quite a few timepieces. Okay, what I'm saying is things will just gain a momentum, but they don't have me, I have it, and I have given away more of them than I own. There's a secret on everything. More cars I've given away, more couches, more jewelry, more purses I have given away than I personally own. That's what thrills me. I own some of them today. They don't mean anything to me. They're faith projects to develop and grow my faith on and allow me to practice on something that's safe under my authority. I don't have to practice and I don't have to wait to come up against someone else's dire need or the church has a need and I'm believing God to pay my rent and I can't help with the building fund. I refuse to live like that. We refuse to live like that, right? Because we're, we're moving as a unit into the fullness of what God's already given us. Not something we have to get. What we do need to learn to receive, though, and not step out of by disqualifying. Amen? That's us. We're the man of verse one, okay? Uh, wealth shall be in his house. Riches shall be in the place he builds. In other words, if you're a builder in the local church, God is going to build your house. Gentlemen, the dominant supply for your career in business is by you building this house. You building it spiritually by your attendance and your faith and leading your family into the fullness of the kingdom and you physically down here with your hands. It's not the job of the women to knock down walls and paint walls. We'll we'll decorate as soon as you're done. Yeah, that's our job. But this, this, uh, uh, sorry, women's lib, didn't mean to set you back. Uh, but that, that's man's work. Yeah. I picked up the sledgehammer and thought, well, I'm, that's not swinging in any direction. It might fall on my toe. That's just, <laughs> they make that, these girls make that look real easy on HGTV, but they must be, they must have a good gym membership. Yeah. I'm like, that's not going to work. I'd rather kick the sheet rock than try to swing a 20. Those things are like 20 pounds of something. And it probably, if I got it swinging, I might go through the <laughs> Through the wall with it. The guys would be like, stop helping us. Go home. O- order us a pizza, right? Wealth, the place he builds. So you have to know that you're a builder. Men are natural builders. They're builders of the house of God tangibly. They're builders of the house of God spiritually. They're builders. That's why we call them men of valor. We, we call things that be not as though they were. So you don't have to go, why well, I'm not a man of valor. Would you want to become one? then start calling yourself one. Uh, We call ourselves the ladies, uh, women of virtue. That means women of power, not because we feel like we are, but we want to be that. Amen. So verse four, you with me? Unto the upright. Again, that's someone who's standing up straight. There ariseth light. That light is beams of light that irradiate from the sun. If I'm standing bent over and crooked and twisted, which means I'm self-absorbed, self-conscious, always thinking about me, my body, my finances. No light is radiating, but when I'm standing upright, the beams of the sun radiate out from me to others. How are we going to be the light of the world if we're not standing upright and letting the light shine so that people can find their way to Jesus? You're not the Savior, but you can show them the way. But you can't show them the way all bent, twisted, and crooked. And you need to recognize the source of that. Amen? When we're not willing to be honest with ourselves and call it what it is, selfishness, self-absorption, rather than focusing on Jesus and what he's already done and is doing and desires to do in me and through me, if you don't call it what it is, you don't have truth. And that way it'll stay the same and get worse and worse. And you're trying to sweep under the proverbial rug what becomes the stumbling block in your own life. Amen? The upright, there ariseth illumination in every sense. Happiness, oh my goodness, here's where we find happiness. People are looking for happiness. 
but they're looking outside of the scripture. Do you know God wants you to be, uh, provide you happiness? He wants you to be happy, but not your own way. I hear, I hear that as a dominant theme. Well, you just need to be happy. And parents, that's your kids. I just want my kids to be happy. I just want people to be happy. That's God's jurisdiction, not yours. And you don't raise people to take happiness from things and places and people. You train them that their happiness comes. I'm happy when I'm doing the word. I'm happy when I'm in the perfect will of God. You're never gonna be happy in disobedience. You're never gonna be happy outside of the will of God. There is no way for you to find something that does not exist, is not authorized in the earth. You have to try to take something that does not belong to you that belongs to another. Everything belongs to somebody. It's just not floating around out there, not belonging to somebody. He is gracious and full of compassion. That word compassion, verse four, love and action. So we cannot say we love God or love people if there's no action. You can't say this, well, I love God, I don't love people. You don't love God then. What what you're saying is that that you love what, what God has done for you. And maybe that's true, but that's not loving him. Because he said, if you love me, you obey. And one of the commands he asked us is to love others as ourselves. And, and I know I would hear some of your thoughts and you would say, well, I don't know if I love myself. You don't have a right to feel differently about you than God does. Amen. That's your issue. You are making it a human thing in your own strength. You'd say, well, Father, you said there's no good thing in me. Yeah, I did. Without me, there's no good thing in you, but I'm in you. So you're a good thing now. Amen. Amen. You you have to decide that you will look at yourself through Jesus' eyes because he's right and you're wrong. Simple as that. (laughs) God right, you wrong. Every time. So it doesn't matter what you think or feel. If it's not the same as him, you get to toss it out and take his, say say this with me, I'm greatly delighted. With speed and strong emotion, emotion. I am well pleased pleased. to favor God's commands. commands. Tell you a story I heard, and it was awesome because it was about somebody I knew. So there was a a, a gentleman, he was in the Navy, and uh, military personnel understand being under command. And so he was, uh, the, the, he was actually stationed about an hour and a half drive from the church he was uh, attending and committed the ministry of service to. And he was working in an area of the children's department. And this children's department, uh, which is what we eventually had, they had a pre-service, which we do, and, and you could be on the pre-service team where you'd set up the curriculum and things. You weren't actually with the kids. So this was early. This would be like 9 o'clock in the morning where the pre-team came in and set up for the teachers. And then so he drove an hour and a half because he was scheduled on PCO, but he was on duty. Did his 9 to 10 o'clock job that he had agreed to do and drove all the way back to the base. And when the pastor found out, they said, oh, you should have just let us know. And he said, I'm under command and I'm not authorized to change the command. Like, what's you talking about, Willis? And so we're under command and we're not authorized to change these commands. You're not authorized to have thoughts or feelings that aren't in line with the command. And that's where we get, before we even get into not obeying the command, we've already disobeyed with our thoughts and, and action and our feelings before we even didn't, didn't do or did the action, did the action wrong attitudedly or not at all. We're under command and we have no authority to alter the command. It's very simple, right? And uh, he happened to have been voted Naval Officer of the Year. Gosh, I wonder how that happened <laughs> with that kind of caricature. Yeah. Wow, right? Say, that's me. I'm the man of verse one. So verse five, a good man showeth favor. He bends, and this word favor means bends. This is not the bent and twisted. This is the bend to serve, the bend to lift, the bend to assist. He bends to give favor to assist anything that his hand finds to do. Not, well, that's not really my, my flavor. 
I, I don't really enjoy that. I, I, I really prefer this over that. No, not, that's not the man. The man that bends. How may I serve? How may I assist you, pastor? You need help in the nursery. You need a sledgehammer. You need the bushes trimmed. I've never trimmed a bush in my life, but I'm willing to learn. The man who bends this way forward to lift his pastor's hands and minister to his heart. That man, greatly blessed, amen. Pros going to prosper in everything he touches. His body, his marriage, his finances, his business. This is the fast track to prosperity. If you want to pay an expensive marketing company and you want to do all these things that the world does, nothing wrong with that. We, we, do, we do marketing around here too. But let me just tell you, this, the long, slow, painful, expensive route, will that be? Or you can just take God's fast track, amen? So like we said, uh, a good man showeth favor. He twines and unites himself and remains as a form of obligation. He will guide his affairs. He keeps measures and maintains his word. So these are, we're t talking, and, and this is the mankind. This is men and women. They bend, they obligate and entwine themselves and keep their word. This, this is the blessed man, like the man we were talking about. I gave you my word. It doesn't matter if it's easy or if it's convenient or it's gonna cost me a tank of gas, anything. I've entwined myself to my promise and my word. I exercise all my affairs with discretion. What's discretion? Understanding the will of the Lord, what the Lord is asking us, amen? amen. This is the greatly delighted man. So we're gonna skip the thoughts and feelings stage and go straight to delighting. Every time we see a command, we're like, let's just go straight to delighting. Wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't that be fast? And wouldn't that be the easy way? There's the easy button and there's the hard button, right? Greatly delighted with speed and strong emotion, we're well pleased to favor our Father's commands. Verse six, surely he shall not be moved. Look at the promises that God is assigning to this person that says, I'll just be the man of verse one. He's not gonna be moved. So when the storms of life come, because they're gonna hit, they're gonna hit hard. And guess what? Hard, fast, and continuously is, is the order of the era. Are the storms gonna come? Yeah, they're gonna come more often. They're gonna come faster, both figuratively and literally. But the house is unconcerned. The upright man is unconcerned because he knows what his life is built on. Amen. He knows where his faith is. He knows where his intention is. He knows where he, who he kneels to and he knows that he keeps his word and his obligation, and God is now obligated. If you wanna obligate God to take care of everything in your life, your body, your marriage, your finances, everything, then just obligate yourself to him. Why, Pastor Marie, why do you have hashtag all in? Because that's what it is, just all in. I don't, my father didn't raise us. He said, you either do it or don't. All in or all out. It's real simple, life, black and white. Gray is complicated. Anybody like gray? Only on a great suit, right? <laughs> he will not waver, be shaken, slip, or fall. He shall be in everlasting remembrance. But look at this promise. He'll be in everlasting re remembrance. I've seen uh, people say in society today uh, about loved ones, I want them to be remembered. I don't want their life to have been for nothing. There was a, a person who wrote... Uh, I printed them uh, some song lyrics because it was very famous and it came up with my relatives many, one of my relatives many years ago. This is the cry of people's heart, but God has answered it. I wanna leave my footprints on the sands of time. Know there was something that I left behind. Leave something to remember so they won't forget. I was here, I lived, I loved. I will leave my mark so everyone will know I was here. I wanna say I lived each day. The hearts I have touched will be the proof that I leave, that I made a difference and this world will see. I want them to know that I gave my all, did my best, brought someone else happiness. Let this world, left this world a little better just because I was here. This verse right here promises eternal memorialization to this man in this life and the one to come because it's just one life. So if you wanna be remembered, just be the upright man of verse one. You don't have to have a hospital wing named after you, a gold brick at Disney World with your name engraved or anything else like that. God promises eternal 
everlasting remembrance, which means memorialized with honor, marked. You'll be the marked man or woman. Heaven and eternity will not forget. Verse seven, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings, rumors, news, and announcements, something heard. There are gonna be a lot of things that you're gonna hear. Does it make them true? But there'll be a lot of things that sound negative and evil tidings. I recommend just not listening to the extent that maybe you've listened, but the, the man that hears those things don't need to let emotions be triggered. Oh, see right there. Oh, right there. That's fear. That's the door. Come on in. I, I should just think, I need to think about that. Maybe I should, but, 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 but. get your butt, B-U-T-T-T, however you like to spell it, <laughs> out of the way, shut that door. You know when you're doing that, just stop. No, 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 see, I'm the man of verse one. I'm just going to get back in that position in verse one, and I'm going to be upright. I'm not going to be bent. I'm going to bend over to serve. I'm not going to be twisted. I'm going to keep my word. Therefore, God is obligated to take care of whatever that is. If it's true, if it's coming, like Phil Collins said, in the air tonight, land, sea, or whatever, <laughs> uh, God's obligated. Otherwise, I'm obligating him by the position I take. Amen. Or you can unobligate him. And he said, you can, you can do it by your hand of your might and power. And he already told you the results of that because he loves you. You will fail. You don't have the ability to take care of yourself and everything you need. Verse eight, his heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. Your enemies are not people. Just if you're wondering, they're devils. So this is not a verse for you to go, oh, I have enemies. I get to, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, <laughs> this is demons. We already know his future. If you're unclear, read the back of the book, okay? So what we can say is uh, no matter what we're hearing, seeing, or feeling, would joy be the appropriate response? Yes. Paul said this, rejoice in the Lord always. So we can say always, that means my thoughts is away, my feelings are away, my words are away, my hands are away. I can rejoice in always, always. This is a man who wrote that verse while locked in a dungeon, his feet in stocks, his back bleeding and in prison. And this is the man that wrote, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. What does that mean? Dip down in. To re means it's already there. The joy is in there. Dip down in and pull it up with the bucket of faith. Amen. Pull that pull it. Dip down in. You don't have to feel it. it. It's a choice. Joy is the appropriate response to everything. Joy is the appropriate response when you look at your bank account. Hallelujah. I'm a tither. It's all, it's all up from here. Joy is the response when you get out of bed and your body's like, mm, your head's about three times the size as it normally is and feels like a 25-pound bowling ball. Joy is the appropriate response. Not in my circumstance, not for my circumstance, pardon me, but in my circumstance. So it doesn't matter what I hear on the TV, what the news is. There's another hurricane, schmurricane in the Gulf. Like, why do we have to have shock and awe? Because every time you turn on the news, that's what you're going to see when they artificially manufacture it. There will be no end to that until we pull down those strongholds by prayer on Tuesday night and, and, and learn how to be better weather warriors like Gabe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how hard is a three-letter word <laughs> said with faith? Yeah. Prayer 101. G-E-T. Yeah. <laughs> Joy is appropriate. Joy is the appropriate approach to the worship service when we come in here. Joy is the appropriate approach to tithes and offerings. Joy is the appropriate approach to your marriage. Joy is the appropriate approach tomorrow morning when your boss calls or you walk into work and you have your coworkers. Joy is the appropriate approach for the man that's greatly delighted in the Father's commands. Why? I have joy because I'm, I'm not thinking about any of those things or people. I'm thinking about my Father's commands. And so I, I have joy always. It's what you're going to look at. Make sure it can deliver you, right? He hath dispersed. He hath given to the poor. He scatters bountifully. This word scatters bountifully means this man understands that he has unlimited fields. I don't just plant strawberries because everybody else plants strawberries. I'm going to plant strawberries and maters. And I know there's different times of the year for different things. You can ask Miss Linda. She knows about things like that. 
But uh, hey, there's lots of things that can be grown at any one given season. Why don't you have all the fields? So we're, we're like, well, pastor's always wanting us to do it, right? Ties, offerings, building, missions. What is he offering you? Fields, harvest to bountifully scatter seed for your own future to have an unlimited harvest beyond your educational ability to produce it, beyond your time left on your chronological timeline, beyond uh, your intellect, beyond your physical needs. God is offering you the ability to have a perpetual harvest. That's called working smarter, not harder. Sowing it in those fields. Amen. His horn, his place at the altar where he is filled with power shall be exalted. He shall raise up with honor and carry the weight of it. When God honors you, you will feel the weight of it and you will learn to carry that mantle of honor. And how we know that you're a person of honor is when you honor others not looking to be honored. So that means you understand the weight of what God has honored you with. You are saved to serve. And so you carry the mantle of honor, and it's a weighty one because it's full of weight of benefit for others. The times don't change the way a faith man lives. So some people will be like, well, it doesn't look like we're in bad times anymore. Hell and high water, it's always coming. But how about the person who lets up off the accelerator when they think everything's good, they coast. The man of faith doesn't change how he acts regardless of the times. So in good times and in not good times, he's the same person with the pedal to the metal. Good, amen. I delight greatly in my father's commands. See, that's my, that's my course, right? The wicked will see it and they will be grieved. Let me tell you this, delighting greatly leaves no room for complaint. Delighting greatly will leave no room for complaint. So if you have a complaining problem, sometimes we're complaining, we don't even realize it. Sometimes, well, husband will sound like, that sounds like complaining. Oh, okay. I don't always, like, do you, do you always get what you're even saying and hear yourself? Sometimes I have to just go, okay, if you say so. And I mean that when I say so. It's not, oh, if you say so. Oh, if you say so, because you always know so, because you know everything. No, I'm just like... I don't, I don't see that, but you do, and you're a higher authority, so you have glasses that I don't have. That's how you boost your IQ on a daily basis right there. That was for free. Your authority says you're doing this. You don't do the, no, uh You're like, okay, I'm not seeing that. Father, can you show me that? Because I want to get in front of that. I, I, I don't want to do, do that. Why? I, everything I sow, I reap. So like my dad wrote a book, get out of the stupid line. (laughs) Read it, get out of the stupid line, amen. So verse Psalms 48 says this, I delight to do thy will, O God. I delight to do thy will, O God. But we've gone beyond that. We're delighting greatly in his commands, all of his commands, not just we're we're, we're past the point of the self-absorbed, what's my destiny? I've been preaching on that for 20 years. Get the CDs. Left that in the dust a long time ago. My destiny is his commands. All of them. Not looking for the will of God for my life because if I look for the commands and the obedience, I'll end up smack in the middle of it all by itself. Won't ever have to look for that. Never looked for that road sign. Just look for the road sign of obedience. Amen? Amen? Joy is not a choice or a feeling. Choose it and maybe you can feel it. Not guaranteeing that. <laughs> Wouldn't recommend waiting on it. Waste a lot of time. I would say this, it's dangerous to complain against your call and all it encompasses. Now, when you hear the word call, don't let your brain go to, well, that's ministry. Ministry means meeting the need and it's spelled W-O-R-K, so that would include all of us. So if you want to go that way, go that way. We're not talking about pastors and fivefold offices. It's dangerous to complain against your call and what it encompasses. If you're a nurse, it's dangerous to complain about having to treat people because you don't like them. If you're called to be a teacher, it's dangerous for you to complain about the paperwork. If you're called to fix people's cars, it's dangerous for you to complain about grease under your fingernails. It's dangerous for you to complain about what you're called to do and all it encompasses. 
So if I'm going to complain about packing another suitcase and getting on another plane and eating another protein bar and getting another delay, that's part of my call, then that's dangerous for us. But that's what we've been doing, complaining about the parts of our call that we don't like. I don't like paperwork. I don't want to be inconvenienced. I don't want to travel. Or some people think they do want to travel. That just means you never have. <laughs> Except the five-star kind. I'm like, what, the 14 public restrooms I just used in the last two days? Oh, you mean Brother Copeland. Well, I'm sorry, he didn't give me a seat on that jet, and you either. Yeah. Don't complain about any part of what you're, what you're called to, of what you're doing for the Lord. Oh, I, I don't mind doing the nursery and taking out the diapers, but I, you know, woof, and those kids, I just need your, don't complain about any part of what you're doing at your job, in this church, any of it, you'll lose grace and you can't afford to give that away. Complaint breaks down protection. How do we know that? 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10. neither murmur ye as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Complaint breaks down the protection. Get a good friend that will tell you when you're doing it. If you're such a bad habit that you don't understand that that's pretty much everything that comes out of your mouth and you've just gotten skillful at changing it so you're, not, you're fooling yourself, then, then tell somebody, hold me accountable. It breaks down God protecting you, just like it did in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Complaint delivers what's yours to the devil. You want to complain? Then whatever God's given you gets to go to him. Not just some of it. Anybody think the devil's fair? You give him an inch, he's taken all. Not a mile, all. That's why the Bible says give no place. No place of any kind to the enemy. He has no mercy in him. He is nothing but darkness. He will kick you when you're down and keep kicking you till you're dead. So don't think that you can give some things to him and that he won't take everything. You, you, what you authorize him to take is all. Amen? Amen. Aren't you glad you came this morning? <laughs> so what are we going to do? Be the man of verse 1. Praise the Lord! I honor the Lord. I am the blessed man. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man that honors with respect and all the Lord that delighteth to bend, to be well pleased, to desire, to favor greatly, wholly, speedily, vehemently, with a strong emotional manner, all his commands. That's the man and the woman that we leave today. Stand up. Let's, let's do this exercise again. Right hand up. Left hand up. Everybody stand. Put your hands all the way up. Close your eyes. Put Jesus on the window screen of your mind and repeat after me. Father, Father from, this day forward, from this day forward, I am the man, am the man who, is who is greatly delighted. I delight greatly in your commands. You have blessed me to be a blessing. I will greatly delight in worshiping in unity with my hands, voice, and heart raised to you, both in the public sanctuary and in private. I greatly delight in giving, studying your word, and leading others to you. you. I greatly delight in serving serving in your house house with your people. people. I greatly delight delight in loving you you and others. others. I am greatly delighted delighted with great speed speed and strong emotion emotion to give my full attention, attention. favor, and honor, and honor to all your commands. All your commands. Thank you for the faith. Thank you for the, faith. Thank you for the grace. Thank you for the grace. And, all and all your many blessings. It is my great delight. Is my great delight. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. To learn more about the ministry and get additional resources, 
You can visit us at jackmyersministries.com and lifefamilychurch.net.